Thank you, everyone. And, you know, great conversation we just had. I hope we can follow that act. But we do have a very trending um, topic right now, you know, ESG, environmental, social governance. You know, it's, um, it's an approach to evaluate an organization beyond what we normally do, which is financially uh, measuring companies. But now ESG compliance is something that's going to become very common for all companies, especially listed ones. So I will not waste any more time. We will jump right into the conversation. I would like to start with Ms. Manjari. You know, you are working with this listed company and naturally now you're required to sort of, you know, um, bring in these ESG uh, policies and stuff. How are you doing this? Can you tell us? Uh, okay, good afternoon and thank you, Vasudha. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here again. And uh, speaking on a topic that's not only topical, but I think extremely relevant, as we um, all understand. The last two years have taught us uh, the importance of something outside of uh, just financial numbers. Um, yes, um, things on ESG have been happening for some time. In India, I think we started with the corporate social responsibility from making it a purely voluntary exercise to now it becoming a, um, a mandatory exercise. But I think ESG has been there across the globe earlier. In India, also in some form, you know, a sustainability reports, business uh, responsibility reports, which something was SEBI was uh, pushing for uh, many uh, years now. But last year, We've had a change now in the business uh, responsibility and sustainability reporting that all uh, top thousand um, listed entities in India are expected to uh, do. Uh, and this is now applicable from 1st of April 2022. So the, it is now mandatory. And uh, for the last one year, you must have seen it in most forums, whether it was on, on WebEx or otherwise physically. I think this has been a you know flavor of the month or the year, whatever you might call it. People are talking about it and corporates are getting their heads together to understand uh, how this is going to pan out? What do corporates really need to do? Every corporate in some manner or the other, at least the top few have been looking into uh, this aspect in some manner. But because it's been made more mandatory now, there is going to be a requirement to look at things in a far more structured way than uh, we have been looking at uh, up to now. So from that perspective, I do see there are challenges. You see, we are also used to looking and structuring the business and uh, looking at the strategic vision, uh, which is absolutely numbers oriented. You know, that's the way we are a profit organization, all corporates are, and therefore numbers play a very big role. But now when along with numbers, I think we will have to see how do we build the agenda of ESG and sustainability within that. So not necessarily is it going to result into tangible there would be an indirect tangible effect on top line, bottom line, but would it be having a, a, a pure number play? Sometimes you have to see the benefits from an environmental social standpoint. Point. Have you had a certain uh, reduction in carbon footprint? Have you had, is your uh, gender and inclusivity better balanced? Is there greater diversity? Are your labor relations much more, uh, um, you know, empathetic and inclusive than what they should be, uh, than what they have been? Uh, have uh, you contributed to society in some manner from your CSR standpoint? Uh, you know, so it, it is going to be a relook. We every corporate has been doing these things, but I think it's going to be a reshaping and re redesigning of your strategy that is extremely important, um, uh, which companies will have to understand. Also, there is going to be there are going to be cost involved when you have to reset an agenda in the organization. There is going to be a greater um, some costs have to be invested. You have to invest in certain things to get a response to it. How do uh, senior leaders, which is the board and the management, then look at um, uh, the whole process so that it is it flows down to the last employee. It ties in with the larger business vision of the company. Say, for example, if I come from an automobile industry, so if we are in the business of making cars and cars is what you make, how do you propose to tie in and bring about the synergy between your whole agenda of making cars and also building in the sustainability aspect? So those are things that when you set your vision and your goals and objectives that companies will have to look at. And I think the... From a, a pure company standpoint, I also see that, you know, the role of the board 
And the role of the management will have to be key here because just as the strategic vision from a financial standpoint gets set at the board and it then devolves down, I think the same agenda has to be understood at the board level. It has to be integrated. Uh, it has to be made operational uh, within the scheme of things that you make it by having committees, you put it in your goals and objectives, your you know key important uh, uh, objectives to accomplish in the year. How do you build monitoring matrix? Because if you don't monitor them, you're not going to get the right outcomes. If you don't get the right outcomes, you are going to be unable to report and disclose them at the end of the year because now this is mandatory. So I think the way we set in, in short, I think what we set up as strategy from a business standpoint, I think we'll now have to look, relook and relook at it with a fresh pair of lens to include ESG within its agenda and everything flows from there. Thank you so much. I think that was a great start. And a couple of things you mentioned, you know, that a lot of companies have already been doing this. And of course, when you introduce a sort of national sort of um, way to measure it, or even a global standard, then that changes the way a company is going to approach these kinds of um, compliance or, or policies, because suddenly your priority as a company and the standard or global uh, report that they're trying to have here are going to, there might be some clash, there might be some challenges, as you mentioned. I would like to bring in Sujat now. Could you tell me a little bit about, from your own point of view, what are some challenges or some of the biggest challenges you think organizations are going to face? Yeah, I think, you know, you know, firstly, this whole aspect of the thinking it as a mandatory or, you know, the compliance driven or, you know, we have to do it. I think that is one aspect, you know, but if you really analyze, uh, you know, why exactly, you know, this has become such a forefront. Right, it is not you know largely because of a law driven and all. Think from a stakeholder standpoint and see the kind of awareness which has happened today. Uh, you know, as a customer, you know when they're evaluating any product or service, they're actually you know specifically evaluating the environmental footprint, how exactly the organization is doing from a customer mindset, and they are very clearly seeing the you know tags, the supply chain, and all of that stuff from a customer standpoint, from an attraction of talent standpoint as well. You know, the millennial generation, you know, they want to, you know, be part of an organization which is also focused on all the three, you know, aspects of it, which is more purpose driven. So from attraction of talent as well, you know, it has become very important that the organization has to demonstrate that it is actually, you know, balancing and having a sustainable development. More importantly, of course, from an access of capital standpoint, I mean, today, if you see whether it is, uh, you know, venture capitals or, you know, private equities and all, playing a huge reliance, you know, with respect to how the organization is actually focusing on these parameters. And of course, I was just reading yesterday, you know, the SBI, you know, came up with the ESG policy and they're going to, you know, uh, you know, start implementing the whole financing aspects. Of course, RBI also is, you know, on working on these aspects. So again, you see from, you know, these aspects, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the partners, I mean, I'm sure, you know, a lot of us, you know, work with variety of partners, just try to see in the last two years, with respect to the due diligence aspect, how many kind of questions which we are actually, you know, facing from the partners, whether it is joint venture, whether it is, you know, uh, you know any of the collaborations, you know, the lot of information should be changed with respect to the practices around that. So I think, you know, if you see from all of these, and of course, you know, more importantly, you know, uh, you know, you know, with respect to the being part of the community and society. I mean, uh, although an organization may have all permits, all licenses and all of that, having a social license is absolutely critical. And when, you know, a large corporation is there, uh, you know, setting up a huge factory, I mean, it has to, you know, uh, analyze the kind of a impact, the kind of environmental you know, pollution aspects or the social commitment and all of that. I mean, do you have that kind of a social license, you know, the, the, from a community and society? I think these are all various parameters and, you know, all the stakeholders have, you know, equally, you know, focusing on all these aspects. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, from these aspects, I think, you know, the, you know, the law is trying to, you know, you know, catch up. Uh, and of course, if you see from a you know, global standpoint, I mean, majority of countries have made it mandatory, but I think ultimately, you know, uh, it's more of a voluntary aspect, you know, I think the businesses are, you know, you know, by virtue of the stakeholders, you know, you know demand that, you know, have to follow not only the reporting aspects, so there are a lot of, you know, practice. I'm sharing, I'll share some of those thoughts aspect from a challenge standpoint. I think the big challenge is that the culture aspect, you know, it, as Manjuri rightly said, it has to, you know, flow from the board. You know, the board has to have this particular agenda. A lot of companies have already started and, you know, set up an ESG committee, although the law doesn't require so. 
and of course they have a esg you know committee within the organization one big aspect is i mean you will not see a esg function in any company you know it's all divided in across several areas i mean maybe some companies have a sustainability function but esg is quite broad so you know with respect to how do you run the program there are so many separate separate initiatives how do you put under one umbrella you now what how the you know consolidate the policies how do you consolidate the data how do you consolidate the technology so a lot of areas but i think the good thing is you know a lot of conversation has already happened you know the board is asking that question the stakeholders is asking this question so that is a you know good aspect i think you know having a conversation like this you know before lunch we we'll have to see how sustainable that would be yeah no thank you i mean which i can see that you have something to say so uh, yeah Pass i the mic so i just want to touch upon the topic uh, which is just discussed so uh, i we all are very well aware that the kind of uh, uh, the way it's expanding and the way esg related integrated businesses are growing rapidly globally and the kind of uh, uh, the portfolio management by the asset owners are increasingly who they have uh, the the portfolio managers who have integrated the esg related assessments aspects into it are ranging up to 17.5 billion us to lean usd and the kind of esg related uh, integrated investment opportunities that is also increasing by 1 trillion usd globally i would say by certain uh, set of measures now uh, again touching upon the stakeholders assessment and the stakeholders requirement we have the consumers we have the employees we primarily we are uh, everybody is talking about the investors yes it's very much relevant and very much evident that yes investors play a very major role uh but apart from that the consumers the employees especially the media where the entire uh, i mean it's just a, a click away and the entire social status and the uh, connections are all connected entirely on uh, on the media platform it's very much because the reputation is also at risk uh what kind of esg and and it has it doesn't has to run into uh, the laundry list of esg related uh, requirements but the company's uh, assessment their own assessment and understanding the uh, particularly what kind of requirements and what kind of uh, uh, understanding is uh, it has to be put in place in order to match up uh, the global standards that is very much important roop please go ahead Yeah, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, just to add to uh, my distinguished uh, panelists here, I think ESG is already existing in the companies, but yes, uh, we all the functions are working in a segregated manner. You have a HSC department which is health, safety, environment. Then you have ethics and compliances. Then you have CSR committees. So all these. different committees or different departments need to integrate and bring in a greater focus to drive esg standards esg behavior i think behavior is the touchstone on of everything because each one of us if we are socially and environmentally conscious and sensitive and we will drive that behavior in others also so just like ethics and compliances i think esg standards also need to and that is where a challenge arises is the tone from the top so the tone from the top needs to be very clear and then this needs to be cascaded the framework is already already there i think there needs to be greater integration there Thank you so much. You know, at this point, I would like to bring in our panelists who have joined us virtually. Hybrid is, of course, the future, and we're already already discussing that today in this panel. Um, so, can I invite uh, Zamir to the conversation? Can you tell me a little bit about? You know, we talked about company compliance with e- e- ESG, but can you tell me about some examples where people have non-compliance with ESG? Yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone, and. Uh... so my flight was cancelled so i'm joining in virtually so i've saved some amount of carbon fuel uh, on this panel of esg and my great friends are also on the panel uh before going to the examples just on the numbers part you know how esg is giving an impressive performance the net flow of esg fund uh, available to the us investors had skyrocketed to about 20.6 billion in 2019 which was four times more than the annual record of 2018 uh esg funds in europe uh, also attracted a, an inflow of about 132 billion in 2019 uh 
more than 70% of the funds were focused on ESG investments. Uh, they had outperformed uh, their counterparts in the first four months of 2020. Nearly 60% of the ESG funds had outperformed the wider market over the past decades. Now, consumers and investors are placing a growing value on ESG, and industry leaders have also responded in a number of ways, uh, including comprehensive sustainability reports, expanding ESG disclosures in the annual reports, uh, providing information to ESG rating agencies, and publicly communicating ESG commitments. So that's the broader framework on investment and where we are heading. Uh, examples which were of the real time and which had consequences on the companies. Uh, when we talk about governance on, in the ESG framework, on the governance, we saw that governance risk had cost very had proved very costly for the investors uh, in terms of examples when we saw of Petrobus or we saw the infamous Enron Corporation fraud which had happened. Uh, Banco Santo was one of the examples. Uh, British Petroleum was in another example and Toshiba was another example where the government's risk had proved very costly for the investors. From an environment point of view, the health and safety records of British Petroleum uh, in the run-up of the Gulf Mexico oil spill, which had happened in 2010, uh, had a lot of consequences for them. Their share price went down, which actually reinforced that you know we need to analyze the ESG performance indicators. Uh, another example of environmental consequences is the wildfire in California, uh, where always there is a stress that you know there has to be a water resources management which has to be built in. Uh, and that's where ESG issue was also analyzed from an investment perspective. Another example of environment I can give is about the Shell company, uh, where there were concerns in respect to about climate change, fossil fuel assets uh, that are becoming a standard assets at the moment in the shareholders resolution uh, and at the annual meetings of large oil companies such as Shell. On the social issue, uh, the labor relations may have a direct impact on your reputation. Uh, we have news newses which are there in the public domain about Walmart uh, being in the, in the news for about labor practices, etc. So on the investment funds and on the examples, here we are on the reality world where ESG plays a very critical role. And I think it's time for us to be in compliance with that in real time. That's my point. Thank you so much. You know, Arshdeep, I would like to bring you into the conversations. You know, so far we've been sort of hearing about how how much support ESG compliance and policies are getting. But is there any place where we might see any kind of pushback? And if so, where? And how do we kind of deal with that? Uh, so I actually differ with that. So actually, I don't see a lot of pushback happening. I, I, since the time ESG has been announced, there have been a lot of things. What about what, what will be the hiccups that we'll face? What are going to be the issues? What are going to be the challenges? But ESG as such is nothing new. I think it's since law school. I think back in 2011, we've been reading about these compliances. These have been in our system for, I think, a decade now. And it's just that the form and the manner in which they apply have changed. Uh, initially, they were voluntary. I think it's still voluntary except for a select few as of now. And I, I think in the past four or five years, even before, the, before uh, SEBI came out with this, we have seen a lot of big organizations, big corporate houses actually voluntarily doing certain things which were basically in, uh, basically in line with these. And actually, I don't see this as a risk, but I see a, this as a huge opportunity for a lot of big, big, big corporate houses to basically rectify or rejig their operations. And in turn, they can move towards a much more sustainable growth of business, which will anyway help them with flow of fresh capital into their systems. I think one of the panelists also mentioned that RBI has also coming up with uh, specific ESG lending norms. Even, even we see uh, World Bank has come out with facilities and they have al already started issuing loans to a lot of companies in India as well, basis their ESG ratings. And a lot of companies, a lot of new startups have already voluntarily starting to meet these uh, ESG norms on a voluntary basis. They are taking out these numbers. 
there are a lot of uh, credit rating agencies who have started actively participating in this industry so i don't see a lot of pushback happening i see this more of as an opportunity for all of us to actually move ahead with the times and see that this is sustainability is the future you can't wealth creation can't be the only goal we have to see that the whole society has to move forward as a as a single unit and not see them separately Oh, thank you. I think that's a great point to make. And you know, since you have kind of mentioned that there, you don't see the risk, but you see see this as an opportunity. Do you mind me having a follow up question? You know, um, what, in your opinion, is like the best practice of reporting and sort of um, like testing and seeing the value of the social impact that companies are trying to create? Like, how do we measure this? Uh, see, the, if you remember the earlier BRR framework which had come out, I think the most uh the worst part about it was it that a lot of big corporates were actually following the box ticking approach everyone was was just ticking boxes yes i have complied with this yes i have complied with this and no one was actually backing it up with actual numbers or qualitative uh let's say qualitative evidence etc so i think the first and foremost i think the big organizations the top 1000 listed companies have to lead by example and they have to avoid greenwashing the term that is now becoming very popular globally that a lot of these companies are actually greenwashing their esg compliances they make huge huge claims and in turn uh, they are not backed by evidences and yeah and even a big a very big example of this is if you have been seeing the newspapers in the recent past i think exxon mobil has been uh, rated with better esg scores than tesla so i think that's where the issue of greenwashing has come up and we need to actually see and de- delve deep into what the business what the actual business is and how the wealth creation are the, these companies are doing just to add you know with respect to the measurement and all i think you know that is another debate altogether you know who have already started reporting you know currently we have several standards there is gri ssb integrated tdfc i mean cdp there are a lot of standards you know which are there adding to that there are a lot of ratings as well so uh, you know a lot of debate right now is going on with respect to the standardization of all these standards so i think that's a you know big debate happening and you know ifrs and a lot of organizations which are actually trying to come together to have a very standard approach with respect to these reporting because you know there are so many standards and there are so many organizations same with respect to the ratings and assessments as well Manji. yeah and continuing on the same point i think even sebi has come out with three different types of disclosures to make and if anyone read them would realize that uh, they couldn't be more broad than what they were so there is any and everything that a company does would fall within those uh, uh, you know standards and and that is very difficult so uh, like earlier some of uh, my fellow panelists actually mentioned that esg is not an old thing it is something that we have been doing for the longest period of time we do have Uh, policies and procedures to manage our employees our workforce our contract our labor unions we have uh, policies on remuneration we've got policies on ehs we've got uh, um, uh, policies on you know when we've been looking at uh, formulating our products we try to keep them as sustainable as possible it's just that it was all so scattered within the organization there was no one such thing that required you to report i think the biggest challenge that uh the companies today continue to face is and the bigger the company the you know the challenge is bigger especially for the top 1000 who have to make this reporting it is uh, it is how do you collate them all and what do you create as a like in my company we started a sustainability vertical actually to you know so to see how are we going to bring all these things together under that particular vertical so that the monitoring and the matrix of that becomes much easier because each company say for example in my uh, company in uh, maruti suzuki if we were uh, making a product which is uh, which is going to look into the future which is hybrid if we are going to experiment with say um, you know compressed biofuels etc so there will be somebody in the organization who's going to be looking into it how does that tie back into the department of sustainability so that we can collate the information correctly we can um, uh, assess and sanitize that information accurately and then make the disclosure necessary to uh, the regulatory body so i think uh, as organizations that will be a big task for all of us i think it was always there it's just the title you know looking through the glasses maybe it is not the glasses now it is a magnifying glass or probably microscope is what happened and that really is pushing all these departments to really 
things from a strategic standpoint. I think that is the key difference. No, it's absolutely right. I would mention this thing since coming from the warehousing logistics background, uh, the company, I mean, the kind of investment, because I handle the investment side also. So, so the kind of investments and the kind of institutional investors, for an example, uh, they want to put in money. So they have, and there are funds who have the LPs foreign uh, based. They specifically mention and they have, uh, they want us to include in the term sheet as well, that the, what kind of environment impact assessment we have made, uh, what is the carbon footprint and uh, uh, what is the emission happening and, and various other factors which are being integrated into the ESG reporting. This is very, very, very significant right now. So that's the reason setting the tone right at the top is very much important. Just something that um, came to my mind, and Sujat mentioned it a little bit earlier, that, you know, your investors, especially if you're listed, your investors, your customers, customers would hold true for any company, uh, the regulatory bodies, uh, the stakeholders, the people who are now looking to see whether you how and in what manner are you running your ESG agenda are just going to be that many. Before this, we did it, but there was nobody who was looking at it, uh, at uh, the companies with such a lens. So now the, to top with that is a reporting requirement. So I think all of that makes this a, a great um, you know, topic to talk about, a great uh, area of focus. I think it is a, it's a step in the right direction and uh, companies have to understand that they owe something to the society and the way things are. We have all seen the kind of heat that we've been going through in, in, uh, in um, Delhi. And, you know, we, we have to sustain uh, the, the planet much better than what we are doing right now. And I think all of us here and the companies that we represent and the world at large has a big responsibility. Um, no, thank you so much. And you are right. You know, no one's going to say that ESG is bad or wrong or no, everyone is on board with this. The issue comes in when you have, as you said, a magnifying glass on companies all of a sudden, and they're asked to sort of show proof or like, or they're asked to meet a different standard than what they have been working with. That's when the changes come in. And that's what we are discussing today. Um, we are coming down on our time. So I would like to go, um, start with Zamir on closing comments. So, you know, I mean, what the best impact of ESG, which is happening is because of the investors, board of directors, stakeholders and the shareholders, you know, they, they are leading that. Uh, being an investor in US companies, I am seeing a lot of proposals which are put forward before the board and the board also has to decide whether, you know, the sustainability report has to be released, etc. But I am seeing this initiative coming very broadly, very vociferously across the globe. Now, I'll, I'll give you certain examples which have really also benefited that. So, therefore, the companies also will have to look at it positively. Uh, what has happened with the impact of the investor influencing these strategies? Walmart in 2012 landed up saving about $231 million by means of efficient waste management and recycling. An estimate of about $150 million was saved through renewable energy projects and zero waste programs. So that's the benefit which is happening where the stakeholders are pushing for ESG compliance. The, the second thing which I would speak about investors influence strategy is that when this British Petroleum uh, BP Gulf of Mexico 2010 uh, oil leak happened, the total cost to British Petroleum are hard to estimate, but point is that the economists said that they lost about 42 billion in cleanup and compensation cost. Uh, BP share price lost about 50% uh, during that particular cat catastrophic period. So that's the consequence about it. You also see there are, there are shareholder proposals which are coming. Exxon Mobil, which was given one of the examples, the company landed up adding a climate scientist to their board of directors. So that's the impact of ESG and the shareholders initiative. Uh, we talk about proxy voting, which is happening. So there is a mechanism known as two degree scenario analysis, which means that every company should adopt a globally accepted limitation of temperature growth to avoid significant catastrophic changes to the climate. When this proposal came before Exxon Mobile, their institutional investors, uh, Fidelity, Vanguard, BlackRock, they all voted for the largest shareholders and 62% of the shareholders voted in favor of adopting that for ExxonMobil. Uh, when it comes to divestment, uh, 
what is happening is that companies and the uh, the investors and the institutional invest investors particularly are now going away from the products which is hard hitting to the climate or the global uh, world itself so when we saw this movement on palm oil the, there was a norwegian sovereign fund by the name of nbin they actually landed up divesting in 58 companies where which were in the palm oil sector because the impact of the palm oil which was having on the on the global environment we saw public policy engagement point number 6 is where in 2017 around 390 investors representing about 22 trillion in assets issued a letter to the urging to the government of the G20 nations to support and implement the paris climate change so that's where we are heading right now definitely esg has consequences uh, if there are non compliances it also affects your stock prices and there are lot of consequences which are going to the companies but i think in the right spirit the right minded companies as well as the institutional investors are pushing for this esg compliance and i think within few years it will be a norm thank you thank you i hope that we can see that vision come true um we are almost out of time now but ashdi please your final thoughts i won't take a lot of time so just to crux up i think sustainability is fast becoming a key 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 priority for a lot of big corporate houses even there's a there has been a corresponding shift in the mindset of a lot of investors with the prior with priorities expanding to basically include sustainable growth along with the primary goal of wealth creation right and even me coming from a background which is like the solar industry we have seen a lot of big houses now we actually go- we are going to actually help a lot of these big houses meet their uh, green energy requirements and also we have seen in the last one year there has been a huge huge boost with a lot of clients coming up with these requirements and i think this is the future i think it, there's no need there's no one is actually fighting this this is a change which is good for us as as a whole industry and i think we should go along with the move yeah that's it thank you thank you so much and now to our panelists who are here Going just down summarize, you know, I mean, leaving us in all these terminologies, you know, I mean, is it the right thing to do from an environment standpoint? I mean, if you are using renewable energy, if you are reducing, you know, carbon footprint, if you are recycling, is it the right thing to do? Same thing from social aspects. I mean, if you are having diversity, if you are taking care of your workmen, you know, workers' safety, is it the right thing to do? Right? You know, if you think from that standpoint, I think you know this is absolutely you know critical, and I think you know we just need to move forward. And as general councils, you know. we can actually play the role of a champion uh, you know in this whole aspects because we are the one who can actually work with all of the functions and can uh, you know integrate so i think there is a great amount of leadership role as well which gcs can actually play with respect to the esg with respect to championing and pushing this uh, can make it general agenda. champions and yeah. general council yeah, absolutely thank you um roop your final words i think being socially and uh, environmentally responsible it leads to brand equity and um, um and we each one of us have to be socially and uh, environmentally responsible while we read all the policies which are there in the framework in the companies they are all theoretical but how do we implement them practically is the key so um reading going through online trainings and so on and so forth is one thing but implementing them practically not only your professional lives but also in your personal lives is the key and because then it evolves into your own behavior i mean very simple example is wearing seat belts so in a company you will be mandated to wear seat belts even in a, at a rare in a rare seat but in your personal life you kind of try kind of overlook this aspect but if you are doing it regularly in your professional life you'll tend to implement it in your personal life also and which makes driving safe for yourself as well as for others thank, thank you, you for the analogy thank you as i mentioned earlier also getting the basics right it's basically having the purpose set in place by the company uh setting the tone right at the top having the vision and purpose very well, specifically and categorically stated and it has to be communicated the kind of efforts the company is putting in in regards to this particular space that has to be communicated well in the organization because if we can see 75% of the uh, uh, millennials i mean uh, the population comprising of 75% of the millennials by 2025 what we have, what we are seeing are actually driven by the sustainability in the company 
that what they are looking at, at as well as uh, if the company is culturally and uh, socially environmentally uh, responsible so that that is what we are basically uh, building up the uh, nation building what we as uh, we call as nation building towards uh, including this particular areas as well so looking after that okay uh, i think everything has already been said is esg a good thing to do yes it is a good thing to do corporates uh, have been mandated to do it so i think uh, while you know integrating goodness with process with understanding with integration with creating the right kind of metric for monitoring it and having very clear um, uh, sanitized data that you use to adopt certain uh, disclosure standards and i'm sure over a period of time they will become more concretized and then make sure that reporting helps what is in it for the corporates uh, your investors are happy your customers are happier uh, the regulators think highly of you and uh, your stakeholders benefit from this the intangible benefits uh, i i i would also say that there would be tangible benefits in in uh, in in view of uh, financial benefits also it will add to your uh, uh, top line and bottom line but be beyond of that it makes you an employer of choice it also enhances your brand image as a socially responsible corporate citizen and i think that is the need of the hour thank you so much i think that summed up perfectly um we're not going to be taking any questions we'll be closing the panel here but there is time for everyone to network and speak to our speakers on one one to one basis thank you so much